Chapter Forty One of Pride and Prejudice. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Chapter Forty One. The first week of their return was soon gone. The second began. It was the last of the regiment's stay in Meryton, and all the young ladies in the neighbourhood were drooping apace. The dejection was almost universal. The elder Miss Bennets alone were still able to eat, drink, and sleep, and pursue the usual course of their employments. Very frequently were they reproached for this insensibility by Kitty and Lydia, whose own misery was extreme, and who could not comprehend such hard-heartedness in any of the family. "'Good heaven! What is to become of us? What are we to do?' would they often exclaim in the bitterness of woe. "'How can you be so smiling, Lizzie? Their affectionate mother shared all their grief. She remembered what she had herself endured on a similar occasion five and twenty years ago. "'I am sure,' said she, "'I cried for two days together when Colonel Miller's regiment went away. I thought I should have broken my heart.' "'I am sure I shall break mine,' said Lydia. "'If one could but go to Brighton,' observed Mrs. Bennet. "'Oh, yes, if one could but go to Brighton! But papa is so disagreeable! A little sea-bathing would set me up for ever! "'And my aunt Phillips is sure it would do me a great deal of good,' added Kitty. Such were the kind of lamentations resounding perpetually through Longbourn House. Elizabeth tried to be diverted by them, but all sense of pleasure was lost in shame. She felt anew the justice of Mr. Darcy's objections, and never had she been so much disposed to pardon his interference in the views of his friend. But the gloom of Lydia's prospect was shortly cleared away, for she received an invitation from Mrs. Forster, the wife of the Colonel of the regiment, to accompany her to Brighton. This invaluable friend was a very young woman, and very lately married. A resemblance in good humour and good spirits had recommended her and Lydia to each other, and out of their three months' acquaintance they had been intimate, too. The rapture of Lydia on this occasion, her adoration of Mrs. Forster, the delight of Mrs. Bennet, and the mortification of Kitty, are scarcely to be described. Wholly inattentive to her sister's feelings, Lydia flew about the house in restless ecstasy, calling for every one's congratulations, and laughing and talking with more violence than ever, whilst the luckless Kitty continued in the parlour repined at her fate in terms as unreasonable as her accent was peevish. "'I cannot see why Mrs. Forster should not ask me as well as Lydia,' said she. "'Though I am not her particular friend, I have just as much right to be asked as she has and more, too, for I am two years older." In vain did Elizabeth attempt to make her reasonable, and Jane to make her resigned. As for Elizabeth herself, this invitation was so far from exciting in her the same feelings as in her mother and Lydia, that she considered it as the death-warrant of all possibility of common sense for the latter, and detestable as such a step must make her were it known, she could not help secretly advising her father not to let her go. She represented to him all the improprieties of Lydia's general behaviour, the little advantage she could derive from the friendship of such a woman as Mrs. Forster, and the probability of her being yet more imprudent with such a companion at Brighton, where the temptations must be greater than at home. He heard her attentively, and then said, "'Lydia will never be easy until she has exposed herself in some public place or other, and we can never expect her to do it with so little expense or inconvenience to her family, as under the present circumstances." "'If you were aware,' said Elizabeth, "'of the very great disadvantage to us all which must arise from the public notice of Lydia's unguarded and imprudent manner—nay, which has already arisen from it, I am sure you would judge differently in this affair.' "'Already arisen?' repeated Mr. Bennet. "'What, has she frightened away some of your lovers? Poor little Lizzie! But do not be cast down. Such squeamish youths as cannot bear to be connected with a little absurdity are not worth a regret. Come, let me see the list of pitiful fellows who have been kept aloof by Lydia's folly." "'Indeed you are mistaken. I have no such injuries to resent. It is not of particular, but of general evils which I am now complaining. Our importance, our respectability in the world must be affected by the wild volatility, the assurance and disdain of all restraint which marks Lydia's character. Excuse me, for I must speak plainly. 
If you, my dear father, will not take the trouble of checking her exuberant spirits, and of teaching her that her present pursuits are not to be to the business of her life, she will soon be beyond the reach of amendment. Her character will be fixed, and she will, at sixteen, be the most determined flirt that ever made herself or her family ridiculous. A flirt, too, in the worst and meanest degree of flirtation, without any attraction beyond youth and a tolerable person and from the ignorance and emptiness of her mind, wholly unable to ward off any portion of that universal contempt which her rage for admiration will excite. In this danger Kitty also is comprehended. She will follow wherever Lydia leads. Vain, ignorant, idle, and absolutely uncontrolled! Oh, my dear father, can you suppose it possible that they will not be censured and despised wherever they are known, and that their sisters will not be often involved in the disgrace? Mr. Bennet saw that her whole heart was in the subject, and affectionately taking her hand, said in reply, "'Do not make yourself uneasy, my love. Wherever you and Jane are known, you must be respected and valued.